Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about geologically risking shale plays. Now, a bit of a story of Goldilocks, really. You know, you've got to have something that's just right. Um, a lot of factors go into that, and I'll go into each one of them a little bit uh, later in the video. So, shale plays are not risk free. There's this sort of view that uh, it probably is to some extent, but it isn't. So, you've got things that come in you've got thermal maturity, you've got to have the right mineralogy, you've got to have the right organic content, so you have an organic richness. Kind of helps if it's thick enough as well, but not too thick, not too dispersed. It obviously needs porosity to store the hydrocarbon that's generated within the shale. Simple structure also helps. And if you've got all that, you're going to get a great shale play. Goldilocks depth and homogeneity kind of helps as well. Now, usually when you're looking at um, conventional plays, there's a binary answer. You know, it works or it doesn't. But in shale plays, it tends to be a bit more, well, it kind of works or it works really well. So if we go to risking, so this is, uh, I have a video on, on risking conventional plays. So you've got a chance of success, which is the chance of having all the elements working, sufficient quality and quantity to get you the recoverable volume that you're prognosing. So good things about shale is it's no trap, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, don't have to worry about seal either. So you basically have got three factors that you're worried about. You're worried about the reservoir, which is where you have the porosity, the thickness, and mineralogy and brittleness, so you can actually frack it within it. Then you've got to have the organic content, and then you have to have the thermal maturity. So all of those have to work and work in the right way for you to get the hydrocarbons out there. I'll talk about each one of these elements a little bit first. So first of all, there's organic content. If you haven't got the organic matter, it's not going to happen. Just, just isn't. So... Generally, in terms of source rocks, you need to be above about a 2% TOC threshold. Now, if you look at the really good shales, which are listed here, so back in 11%, Marcellus up to 20% are its best bits, Strawberry in the Permian up to 8%, Eagleford 5%, maybe a little bit more some places, Bajanov in Siberia 11%, Barnett 5 to 6%, Duvernay in Canada 8%, Woodford in Oklahoma 7%. So these are all fairly high, and they all tend to be marine. So they don't tend to be Site 2 herogens. Type 1s are quite rare anyway, and Type 3s tend to be a bit more gassy. But they all tend to be marine shales with relatively high TOCs, total organic contents. Next, it's got to be cooked right. So they need to be thermally mature to generate hydrocarbons. So you've got burial and you've got heat flow. So this is a burial diagram from a video I've done on source rocks. And you basically have to be in an oil window to get uh, oil. You have to be in a gas window to get gas. So if you're undercooked, like this piece of toast, ain't going to happen just right that's great then overdone this isn't going to work so you've got your organic source rock thermally mature organic matter going to oil and you're looking at about between 90 and 100 degrees to up to about 150 degrees of temperature when you're looking at an example here from eagleford in texas so this is the burial so again shallow here outcrops along here somewhere near san antonio and then gets deeper and when you transfer that into the uh, type of hydrocarbons, so you have volatile oils, then you get condensate wet gas, and then you have deep right gas. So you have immature, just right, a bit overdone. So this is from uh, an ETL report on uh, Eagleford. So you've got to have the thermal maturity. Then you have to have the porosity. Now, oil is stored in, in, in pores within the shale. Now, they're very small pores, hence they're called nanopores. There's very little permeability, and I'll link to a video on permeability in the description. Uh, typical values, 5 to 12% uh, versus 10 to 30% for conventional reservoirs. But still, you have to have the hydrocarbons to store the porosity. And there, there are three basic ways you get pores. You get inter-particle uh, Processes are scanning electron microscopes. These are quartz grains, and these are pores with the, within the within uh, between the quart, uh, quart grains, quartz grains. Inter-particle porosity, so that's within uh, particles, and then organic matter pores. So you have organic matter that gets uh, heated up, generates hydrocarbons. That also generates voids, and some of the hydrocarbons will stay in voids. Some of the hydrocarbons will be uh, this, uh, deleted. So you've got this ternary diagram, these triangles, and you can see where potential pores. Uh, into pores would be in your pore system. Next one is mineralogy and brittleness. Now you need to have some brittleness within the rock to enable to frack it. If it's pure clay minerals, so if it's up here on the sternary diagrams, uh, kaolinite, elite, smectite, chloride, etc., it just won't frack. So you're not going to get anything out of it. 
So you need a bit of quartz, so you need a bit of carbonate within that. Now, many of the good shales have that. So if you're looking at uh, Marcellus, Bakken, Woodford, Wolfcamp, they all have got a fair bit of quartz and carbonate, not that much in the way of clay minerals. So this, we're talking about the inorganics here. There's also organic matter on top of that. Barnet has a bit more clay and it's a bit worse rock than some of the others. So again, needs to be based in the right place. Next thing that kind of helps is structural simplicity. Uh, you really don't want things very complicated. You don't want a lot of faulting. You don't want a lot of folding. You don't want thrusts. You really don't want salt diapers within a place. You just want something that's simple and boring. Now, it's very boring for seismic interpreters to interpret something like that. You know, just straight reflectors. This is from the Eagleford. Uh, this is from the Permian. Uh, this is from TGS. Um, so again, you need to have a reasonable amount of simplicity so you can do your horizontal wells. And these examples are horizontal wells on this uh, on this depth section from TGS's website. If you have a lot of complexity, means things are more difficult to drill, means that you may not have the space to do your laterals, but although some fractures would help you there with productivity. And then you need to have a reasonable amount of thickness. Now, ideally, most US, most of the US shales are between 100 foot to 350 foot thick, so 35 to 107, 110 meters. Uh, I've got the table here. Again, uh, Permian Basin shales tend to be much thicker than others, because, and what that means is that you can do multi-depth multi lateral wells, or several wells uh, uh, targeting different depths, because, and that's the reason for its, uh, its high productivity. But again, so if you've got a very thin shale, not going to happen. Homogeneity helps as well, because it reduces the uncertainty. You can be local homogeneity, you can be more regional homogeneity, and you can map all of these factors together with the vast amount of data that you get within shale. And understanding the heterogeneity can help you improve more drilling, integrating more data, et cetera. And seismic characterization helps a lot within that. Now, okay, the structural interpretation is quite boring, but the um, characterization, trying to get properties out of seismic data is very interesting indeed. And there's been a lot of work done with machine learning, artificial intelligence, use that more and more to try to predict uh, property distribution, predicting well performance, a lot more data analytics within the unconventional space than they are within the conventional space because you have that much more data. Another thing you do is uh, type curve. So what that is, it's a stereotypical curve for a well. So initially you have initial productivity and then that declines fairly rapidly. It doesn't in all shales. And then you have EUR, which is the total sum of uh, hydrocarbons that, uh, that you'll recover. So you can map things like IPs. That gives you an idea of what uh, performance would be. Um, and from that, you can use that, particularly or also the decline rate, to try to predict how much you're going to get out of that, out of a particular thing. In terms of volumetrics, it's pretty similar to conventionals. You know, all in place is the gross stock volume. So that's the total thickness multiplied by the area. Multiply that by the porosity, multiply that by the saturation and a formation volume factor. And to get the gas out of an oil reservoir, you'll have a gas oil ratio. Recoverable volume would be hydrocarbon place times the recovery factor, which tend to be quite low for shales, obviously, because they're very complicated rocks. So you tend to use type curves a lot more as how many wells you're going to drill and what each well is going to produce. Um, you can also map uh, in places. Uh, thousands of barrels or BCF per section square mile. That's used quite a lot in North America to give you an idea of play richness. In terms of shale gas, you've got two portions. You've got the free gas and you've got the sorbed gas, which is gas uh, absorbed onto onto particles uh, within, the, within the rock. Um, free gas, gross rock volume, matrix porosity, gas saturation times gas expansion factor. So fairly simple to, similar to conventional uh, um, Volumetric sorbed gas is gas storage capacity times shale density, and the recoverable volume is the hydrocarbon place times the recovery factor. Again, a little bit more complicated than uh, than conventionals, but uh, these things are down and fully well understood. Good shales are rare, very rare. So this is a diagram showing uh, the distribution of source rocks throughout the world, throughout geological times. So you have some key intervals. So you have a Ligomiocene. You have Aptian Turonium, which includes Eagleford and Ibrara. You have Upper Jurassic, which includes Haysville and Marco American and Argentina. Also quite a lot of other rocks, such as Bajanov, Cambridge Clay, etc. You know, we got really lucky then during the Upper Jurassic. Then you have um, Pennsylvania to Lower Permian, so that includes the Permian Basin. Upper Devonian to Lower Mississippian, so that's uh, Marcellus, uh, Bakken. Uh, and then you have Silurian. Utica is actually all division, but Silurian is, uh, for example, the Tanisoft in, in Algeria. Libya, which may also be a, 
potentially significant uh, shale which may produce in the future. Okay, so these things are quite rare. And these are some uh, maps that uh, were posted on LinkedIn by Eddie Ong. Uh, he gave me very kind permission to make a video out of them. And that's again on my YouTube channel. And then you've also got your background factors. So a lot of above ground risks, social, economic, HSE, political, compared with conventional exploration. So this is a um, aerial picture of uh, Texas. So you've got all these well pads and roads connecting them. Much larger surface impact. Typically for, an for a conventional, you'll have one pad. For an unconventional, you may have 10 pads for the same equivalent volumes. You also need pipelines, roads, etc. Much greater tempo of operations. Looking at the amount of wells drilled relative to a conventional play is just, you know, we're talking 10 times more plus. You need water, fracking, propent, etc. And then you have the waste products, which need safe disposal. And also there's a threat of induced seismicity of uh, or man uh, caused mini earthquakes, which has been a, starting to become an issue in Texas and Oklahoma. In order to make everything work, obviously you need the right factors. You need to engage correctly with communities, engage correctly with politicians, regulators, and resource ownership plays a big role. The USA, the landowner owns the mineral rights. Other countries, the government does. So the landowner doesn't get very much out of it. The communities don't get very much out of it. Hence, they have a uh, much greater opposition. Also, uh, population density. If you've got a low population density in a farming area like North Dakota or West Texas, that's a downside easier than uh, working somewhere like Europe, for example. So sum up, Goldilocks. Light tight oil, it's not risk-free. It's giving you less chance of a dry hole. You'll get something, but are you going to get enough to justify drilling the well? Risk of disappointing well performance, particularly when you're extending beyond core acreage, but you've got to try that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mapping plays systematically. Characterization will help you understand quantify risks. And there's a big industry doing just that in North America that works very effectively. Plenty of shale shells worldwide. You know, Poland had a big enthusiastic shale exploration program in um, the early 2010s didn't come to anything, drilled 79 um, sub-commercial wells. Monterey in California didn't really work out. But there's some others are potentially there. And you need to be in the Goldilocks zone, and some of these things are. I mean, my personal things for the future would be Guacamuerta in Argentina, which has expressed significant growth. Tanazov and Franian in Algeria and Libya. And then the Bajanov in Western Siberia, basically, but also potentially the Manic in, in uh, Volga Urals, Caspian uh, in Russia. Again, got to remember the above ground risks, getting people on board, getting this going. So please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.